The next item of business is a debate on motion number 1792 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on the implications of the EU referendum on higher and further education. May I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to speak to and move the motion. Up to 13 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome this opportunity to open this afternoon's debate. The people of Scotland have gave a strong and unequivocal vote to remain in the EU. And I believe that is the result of Scotland recognising the social, the economic and the cultural benefits of EU membership for individuals, businesses and communities. And that includes the benefits for the staff and the students who study and work at the universities and colleges across Scotland. Parliament will be well familiar by now with the five key interests that the First Minister set out following the referendum outcome relevant to today's debate. Democracy, economic prosperity, social protection, solidarity and influence. Given Scotland's unequivocal support for remaining in the EU, the First Minister secured a mandate from the Scottish Parliament to explore options to protect Scotland's relationship with the EU, maintaining membership of the single market and freedom of movement. Since then, Scottish ministers have engaged closely with their counterparts in the UK and across the EU to ensure that all options are kept on the table. We have established a standing council led by the principal of the University of Glasgow, Professor Anton Muscatelli, to advise the Scottish Government on securing Scotland's relationship with Europe. And I welcome the council's prioritisation of universities and colleges as an early topic for consideration. Now, in the days immediately following the referendum, I personally made contact with most of our university principals, University Scotland and NUS Scotland to listen to their views. And I followed this up with further discussions with principals, staff and students during my visits to colleges, college and university campuses over the past few months and a visit to the University of Dundee this very morning. I'm also grateful to the role played by our Chief Scientific Advisor, Professor Sheila Rowan. She's been reaching out to the sector in a number of ways and was indeed in Brussels only last week meeting key stakeholders. Presiding officer, in my time this afternoon, I'd like to highlight what, uh, three issues which I believe are greatly affecting the sector. Public, funding and influence. Presiding officer, the impact of the EU referendum on students and staff is the issue that has been raised with, uh, by everyone when I've spoken to them and indeed reflects my own concerns. This relates to the free movement of staff and students across Europe as well as to the attractiveness of our universities and colleges to staff and students from the rest of Europe. We have a world-class further and higher education system. Indeed, only last month, the Times Higher Education Supplement confirmed that Scotland has five universities in the global top 200. That quality, underpinned by freedom of movement, has attracted the brightest and the best students from across Europe to study here and to make Scotland their home. And that has acted as a catalyst to reinforce the quality and the reputation of our sector, supporting Scotland's influence as well as collaboration across Europe. Latest figures from HESA suggest that almost <coughs> 21,000 or nearly 9% of our university students are from the rest of the EU. Students from across the EU and beyond add to the diversity of our communities and campuses, enrich the learning experience for all and support local businesses and jobs. And I and the Scottish Government greatly value their contribution. That's why the Government moved quickly after the referendum to reassure EU students that there has been no change to the current funding arrangements. And in June, we confirmed that eligible EU students studying in Scotland, including those who start this year, will continue to benefit from free tuition for the remainder of their course. Ross Creer. I thank the Minister. The news that funding status for students from the rest of the EU starting in 2016 is much welcomed, but we've already seen in evidence to the Education Committee that some concern has been raised about the effect on students who would be starting courses potentially in 2017. Will the Scottish Government be able to confirm that funding arrangements for these students will stay the same as it was this year? Shirley-Ann Somerville. 
I thank the member for that intervention. I do fully appreciate the, the point that Ross Greer is making. It's a, a point which the universities, uh, the staff and the students have made to me when I've um, visited them and they continue to do so. Uh, we are actively considering the, the contribution that we can make to moving this debate forward when we're looking at the 17-18 cohort. Uh, so we are looking at, um, at that and I fully appreciate that the concerns that the universities have over this. Now, I'm very proud that the universities are a destination of choice for staff and students, not just from the EU, but from across the globe. My ministerial colleagues have urged the UK government to clarify at the earliest possible opportunity the immigration status for the EU nationals living in Britain once the UK formally leaves the EU. I would also add that I welcome the consensus in Scotland that we need to return to a post-study route to allow talented students to remain and contribute to the Scottish economy. The outcome of the EU referendum makes that more critical. I was therefore disappointed to see the UK government pilot scheme on post-study work visas um, only apply to four institutions in England. And I'm greatly concerned by reports coming from the Conservative Party conference this afternoon about Amber Rudd placing further restrictions on the amount uh, of students, the international students, uh, who can come to Scotland and the UK. Liz Smith. I agree with her in much of what she said uh, about post-study work visas. Uh, there was uh, some indication, however, that there was going to be a consultation about these visas. I think that is a welcome step forward. Shirley Ann Somerville. Well, it would be absolutely fantastic to have a consultation. It would be really good to have that consultation before the four institutions in England yes. had actually been chosen yeah, so that we could take part in that. So if the UK government would like to take a step back and consult, that would be very much welcome. Uh, but we are certainly must be missing that um, letter in the mail that would have suggested that we could have contributed to the four institutions that are currently taking part. Now, President Officer, uh, Socrates or Erasmus exchanges within Europe for university students began almost 30 years ago. A recent impact study identified a range of benefits for Erasmus students, particularly around employability skills and the levels of employment. Universities in Scotland are highly desirable destinations for Erasmus Plus students from the rest of the EU. In 2014, the universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow were the top two universities in the whole of the UK for the number of Erasmus Plus students. But retaining the freedom of movement is a critical requirement for the participation in Erasmus Plus. Freedom of movement is not only important to students, but it also supports researchers, collaborations and careers. Scotland has always looked beyond its own borders, to the rest of the UK, to Europe and beyond. By their very nature, science and research are international endeavours and have no respect for borders. Our universities and research institutions in Scotland are active and valued partners in a large number of research collaborations, with many underpinned by EU funding, and I want to ensure that that continues. Because research collaboration is strongly linked to that second broad area I wish to touch on, and that is EU funding. EU funding benefits Scotland significantly, supporting jobs, delivering infrastructure, sustaining rural communities, providing valuable support for the farming and fishing industries, businesses, and most relevant to this afternoon's debate, of course, universities and colleges. Over the past three decades, EU funding has become intertwined with the fabric of overall funding for education and employability. European funding has helped to deliver high quality college courses that benefit students, the society and our economy. Funding has also significantly contributed to the modernisation of our college estates to ensure we have the state of the art facilities learners need. The Scottish Funding Council has estimated that in academic year 15-16 alone, £11.6 million of European funding was made available to the college sector, supporting upskilling, the development of young people's employability and student support. Together with the funding from the Scottish Funding Council, this is estimated to support around 4,200 full-time equivalent college places. And the potential loss of this EU funding in the future would deal a serious blow to the levels of activity that colleges can deliver. Presiding officer, EU funds acts also as an enabler of international collaboration to drive up the quality of our research and to encourage innovation. Horizon 2020 is the EU's main programme for funding research and innovation projects, and that programme eh, was launched in 2014. Our universities are highly successful in securing funding from Horizon 2020, attracting 185 million euros up to July this year. 
And Horizon 2020 has also been a major source of funding for our research institutes too. They've been awarded an additional eight million euros up until the same date. Now, I welcome Commissioner Moydesi's confirmation that the UK remains fully eligible for Horizon 2020 funding and that projects will continue to be evaluated based on their merit and not on their nationality. But I am concerned to hear anecdotal evidence suggesting that the outcome of the EU referendum may already be having an impact on research collaborations. Indeed, within weeks of the referendum, Professor Sir Ian Diamond gave evidence to a House of Commons committee. He said that some researchers involved in European partnerships have already received word from their partners that they think it's better that the University of Aberdeen does not take the lead in the future. Now, in the weeks following the referendum, I took action to agree a joint statement with University Scotland. Our published statement sets out our commitment to work together using our collective influence in Brussels and elsewhere to ensure that it's well understood that universities in Scotland remain committed to collaborating with our European partners and to attracting the best international talent. And I welcome the UK government's guarantee on European funding, including Horizon 2020, as far as it goes. The guarantee fails to deliver, it fails to take account of the impact of the uncertainty on potential collaborations that Professor Sirian Diamond has highlighted. And it doesn't take account of the longer term funding and other benefits we otherwise would have received as continuing membership of the EU, for example, through future work programmes. I firmly believe that the best way to guarantee European funding is by maintaining our relationship with the EU. Presiding officer, I wish to touch very briefly on the third and final issue, our potential loss of influence in Europe. The challenges of having to comply with rules and regulations developed in Europe without a seat at the table are very well documented. And I believe that the same is true for the development of future funding programmes, policy direction in research and innovation. Should we leave the EU, Scotland would have no role in influencing or shaping those European priorities. Now, of course, there are some countries out with the EU who benefit from EU funding, but they have no way of directly influencing EU priorities. Over the past decade, only 7% of research money allocated by the EU and European Research Council has gone to non-member states. Presiding officer, I'm deeply concerned about the risk that the First Minister has referred to about a lost decade of uncertainty and turmoil. Scotland is and always has been an outward-looking nation. One of the key features of the Scottish Enlightenment indeed was its openness, its commitment to share, to spread and challenge ideas and norms. And at a time when we find ourselves in such uncharted territory, it's good to remember those principles in thinking about how we chart a course for Scotland's future relationship with the EU. We're at the start of that process, but I strongly believe that we must work creatively, positively and constructively, feeding into the negotiations to agree a way forward and to shape a future that reflects and respects the interests of our existing and our future staff and students. And in that spirit, I would urge all members to support the motion in my name. I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move Amendment 1792.1. Around eight minutes, please, Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I move the amendment uh, in my name? And can I be very clear at the start of my speech that uh, both further and higher education institutions in Scotland and indeed in the UK are world class, both in terms of the quality of their teaching and their research and their efficiency. And let me also be very clear that being part of the European Union has played a very major part in that, and I'm sure other colleagues will provide lots of the evidence. And be in no doubt that what has made our colleges and universities great, in, especially in the latter case throughout uh, many centuries, is their outward-looking approach. They have been pioneers in so many respects because they've been at the cutting edge of intellectual thought, invention and innovation, and in modern times in knowledge exchange, which is now obviously so much a part of the important things that they do. So as we ponder the effects of Brexit, we should be in no doubt about the extent of the EU funding which has supported these projects, but neither should we be in any doubt about the adaptability which our institutions have, thrown, uh, have shown throughout their development, their ability to meet what seem like relentless challenges head on, and their ability to attract new streams of funding. They will need all that imagination and creativity like never before, and they will also need the resilience, as this is not going to be an easy time. Let me set out, however, some things that I think are essential if the Brexit process is to be made more smooth. And let me speak first about some interesting things that both John Kemp, the Interim Chair of the Scottish Funding Council, and Professor Andrea Nolan, Chairman of University Scotland, said when they were at the Education and Skills Committee just three weeks ago. 
They said that whilst definitive evidence is only in the process of being compiled, there are already cases where the Scottish or UK lead in a research project is being downgraded from that position because there is now uncertainty about the financial sustainability of the project if some of that EU funding is lost. Indeed, I note that the Vice-Chancellor of Sheffield Hallam University said that he thought that four out of 12 current projects were now under threat. If that tendency grows or is not replaced by other funds, then clearly there could be detrimental effects. Research money is not just the odd investment here and there. It is sizable and it's very significant in terms of what can and cannot be achieved by a university and its collaborative partners. In this respect, the UK Higher Education Research Bill is crucial and can I thank the uh, Chairman of the Education Committee, who I don't think is actually in the Chamber just now, uh, for being prepared to bring some of the evidence about this to committee. So the message must be there that if we are to leave the EU, it does not mean that we will leave Europe or I hope become any less European in our educational ambitions. Happily, there has been extensive growth in the number of collaborative projects with nations out with the EU, most especially across nations like China, India, Canada, Australia and America. These collaborative experiences must, must be worked on like never before, and in doing so, we must make sure that we are as attractive as possible to students and staff from these, in, from these nations. What will help? Well, firstly, the message that government sends out, and that includes the Westminster government's approach to immigration. This chamber knows that prior to Brexit, I had disagreements with my Westminster colleagues about the post-study work visa issue. And whilst I fully understand the practical failures within the previous system, which opened up too many loopholes in the immigration system, I do firmly believe that a new post-study work visa can work and work well, very much to the advantage of Scottish institutions and our economy. Because it simply cannot be right that when we have some of the best brains of foreign nationals helping us with cutting edge research, to which is attached millions of pounds of investment, that halfway through a project, they find themselves that they must go home. If the universities of Bath, of Imperial College London, of Oxford and Cambridge can be permitted to run a pilot PSWV, so can the universities in Scotland. And I, am, I remain hopeful that we will get somewhere on this, and I was pleased to hear the consultation process uh, at the Conservative Party conference. Yes, of course. John Swinney. Uh, I wonder if, I'm grateful to Liz Smith for giving me, I wonder if Liz Smith would care to reflect also on something else that came from the Conservative conference today, which was the Prime Minister's remark that um, uh, clinicians in our National Health Service would be well, from other countries, we were welcome to stay in this country until such time as we have grown our own replacements for them. Does she not accept that is a terribly bad signal to issue? to clinicians who will be part of the self-same research process that she yeah. has commended mm -hmm. and which I value enormously. And does this not cause enormous uncertainty for the global decisions that will be made by clinicians about where they happen to choose to locate to advance their specialisms? Liz Smith, I can allow you some extra time for that intervention. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I, I agree up to a point with the Cabinet Secretary that we do need certainty and we do need the message to be absolutely correct. But what I think is important too is that we give the, the, the full clarity about how we ensure that the best brains, whether they be domestic or foreign nationals, can, can not only be part of the institutions in this country, which we value so highly, but can also be part of that economic future. And the Prime Minister said in her Mar interview on Sunday, and it's been repeated uh, twice in the, in the um, speeches at conference, that there is a, a real determination to make sure that the two match up. And I would suggest to the SNP that there is some light at the end of the tunnel about the consultation process, which let's be very clear about this, we didn't have before today. So I think things are moving in the right direction. Now, I also believe very firmly that when it comes to uh, the funding streams, uh, which are so crucial, uh, attached both to higher education and of course uh, to college education, that actually there is an opportunity uh, for us to reset some of the issues. And perhaps in, in Mr. Russell's case, there's a bit of a, a silver lining in all this, because I, I do remember at an education uh, question time in this parliament some six, six years ago when uh, my late colleague David McCletchy asked the then cabinet secretary how he would resolve the issue of the inherent unfairness of the Scottish government paying the fees of EU students uh, when those rest of the UK and international students studying the exact same courses had to pay fees themselves. Mr. Russell said then, and he said several times uh, thereafter, 
that he was working on ways to get round the problem. Well, what Mr Russell, of course, should have said, that there was actually no way around that problem because of EU law. But now, with Brexit, that problem of that nature will be removed. But what will not be removed are the issues about funding for these EU students. Will they be liable uh, for fees in the same way as the rest of the UK and international students, assuming, of course, uh, that the SNP uh, clings to its policy of, not, of allowing sorry, Scottish domicile students to go free? What arithmetic is the SNP doing to assess whether the payment of fees by EU students in the future uh, will lead, uh, possibly, to a fall in demand for the places? And if it does, by how much? There's an awful lot of arithmetic that has to be done there uh, to ensure that we get the background. So I think while the Westminster government has responsibilities, so too does the Scottish government. Because, uh, and as Ross Greer pointed out um, to the uh, minister, it is very important that that certainty can be given uh, to students who are not just in the courses just now, but who are applying to it uh, for the near future. And you know, that was a point that was put very strongly at the Education Committee. And that is the Scottish government's uh, responsibility for that. So let's be very clear as I finish, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that when the Scottish Government uh, continues to lambast the Westminster Government for its actions, the Scottish Government is responsible for higher education in Scotland and for its funding. And Brexit might not be what FE and HE wanted, but it does provide the Scottish Government uh, with a way out to realign its funding policy and to build a new one uh, based on what we would see greater fairness. Because the mantra that the SNP consistently uses, and which is built into the rocks, I believe, in the sun at Harriet Watt University, to claim that higher education is based on the ability to learn and not on the ability to pay, it might work well for a Scottish domiciled uh, student, but it's never really been true for the rest of the UK or the international student. And Mr Russell knows more than most about what needs to happen in higher education so as to bring in additional income so that our institutions remain wholly competitive on the international stage, not just the European stage. So if he uh, really wants to do something about that, then I think we need to hear what it is. Presiding officer, we know from every briefing which the colleges and the universities have given us that this Brexit problem is serious. But on this side of the chamber, we have faith that the challenge can be met head on and with the same resourcefulness and pioneering spirit for which our institutions are world renowned and with good quality negotiations between the Scottish Government and the Westminster Government. I now call on Ian Gray. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We recently uh, celebrated the news that five of our universities continue to be rated in the top 200 in the whole world, an astonishing achievement for a country our size. Uh, and only last week in this Parliament, Scotland's colleges showcased their remarkable innovation and excellence across the broadest range of skills and technology imaginable. Our universities support the learning of over 230,000 under and postgraduate students, and they contribute an annual economic impact of over £7 billion gross value added. As a driver of the economy, they come behind only the financial services and energy sectors. Uh, nor should we forget that colleges, as the Cabinet Secretary, I think, did rather forget, in spite of swinging cuts, uh, they continue to deliver 20% of higher education and contribute £6 to the economy for every £1 invested. If we are to prosper in the future, this must only increase. For our future lies in high-tech, highly skilled jobs and industries driven by training, research and innovation from our universities and colleges and underpinned by knowledge and new thinking. In a globalised world, there is no other path we can take. How worrying, then, the situation in which we find ourselves. <clears throat> Brexit poses nothing but difficulties, challenges, uncertainty and potential pitfalls for higher and further education. And that is why we will oppose the Tory amendment tonight. It's a Pollyanna formulation that Brexit brings opportunities as well as challenges attempt simply to elide the responsibility for unnecessary risk they have created for our universities and colleges through their Brexit fiasco. For today's debate, we have seen briefings from universities collectively and individually, from Colleges Scotland, from the NUS, from the Royal Society, from the Institute of Physics. Not one has a good word to say about Brexit. Not one. 
They are concerned, they are worried, they are uncertain, and the Tories' rather hopeful claims of opportunity have completely passed them by. First, there is the issue of students. 13,500 non-UK EU students, almost 9% of undergraduates in our universities, not only enriching our university student body, but currently able to stay on and work here when they qualify, helping us meet that demand for the highest of skills and the most imaginative of innovation. The Scottish Government it has, as uh, has been mentioned, at least been able to provide those students already here with the assurance that their fees will be met for the duration of their course. But as has also been noted, no such assurance has been given for next year's entrance now applying. Universities have had to publish prospectuses and seek students while unable to tell them if their fees will be paid. I know that this situation is not of the Scottish Government's making and I acknowledge that as the Cabinet Secretary said, she reached out very quickly uh, to the uh, higher education sector. I know that to be true. Uh, but in the end, this really isn't good enough. Universities have been left in an impossible position. Application closing dates are imminent or even past in some cases. The government must decide and decide soon. And then we have uh, university and college staff. Academia is one of the sectors which has relished free movement of people, going as it does with the grain of centuries of intellectual exchange. 16% of university staff from the EU, over 4,500 uh, people who now face uncertainty about their long-term future. They need assurances now from the UK government, and not just for the next few months or couple of years, Otherwise, they will consider leaving. It's not just the formality of their immigration status that matters here. It is their sense of being valued and wanted, and that has been badly shaken. And then there's research. Almost £90 million of research funding in 2013-14. 13% of Scottish universities' total funding from European Union sources. And yes, we know that the Prime Minister has given assurances that research funding uh, will not suffer, but there is no detail, or frankly, in the sector, much confidence. And it's not just in the universities themselves. Companies like Sunamp in my constituency, world-leading research and development in renewable heat, driven by innovative chemistry from the University of Edinburgh and looking to Horizon 2020 for next stage development. As the Cabinet Secretary said, £165 million of Horizon 2020 already won in Scotland, but what will replace that in the future? Even if these funds are underwritten in the short term, in the long term, how do we replace access to an €80 billion Euro fund to support research? And once again, this is, not, this is about people, not just money. As, as Liz Smith Illustrated, we already hear of research collaborations thinking twice about UK partners, certainly as project leaders, if not as participants, because they are unsure now of our dependability and commitment to partnership. And all of this is true of the college sector too. Three and a half thousand student places dependent on European Social Fund funding alone, £13 million per year a significant contribution to the sector. And while it's true that fewer EU citizens come to Scotland specifically to study in our colleges, a matter of hundreds rather than thousands, it is also true that thousands of our students in colleges are EU citizens already living here and choosing to access further education to pursue uh, their careers. They are now unsure how long they will be able to do that, what their status will be, or whether, again, they are indeed welcome. And I want to close by mentioning an EU programme that the Cabinet Secretary rightly mentioned, that's Erasmus, the European Exchange Programme. And I hope that we can maintain Scotland's place in Erasmus because it epitomises the internationalism which has underpinned our universities and colleges for centuries. And it reminds me of the example of John Mayer from North Berwick in my constituency, schooled at Haddington Grammar in my own hometown, uh, but a fellow student too uh, of Erasmus himself at college uh, in France, the College de Montague, graduating later 
in Navarre in Spain before teaching at the Sorbonne and then returning to Scotland as principal of Glasgow University and moving later to St Andrews too. He was the originator of the idea of union between Scotland and England and the fundamental principles which underlie human rights law. Mayer is an example which epitomises the internationalism of Scottish education, a historic strength which predated the European Union but sat so well with it. Come to a close, please, Mr. And Blair. which we must now find ways to ensure survives the threat of Brexit. We now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of up to six minutes, please. And I call, first of all, Stuart McMillan to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, President Officer, Scotland didn't vote to leave the EU. We actually voted to remain. And Scotland continually punches above its weight in research, ensuring access to competitive research funding. And Scotland is a country that needs to grow its population to help address the skills gaps and also deal with an ageing population. This is why free movement of people is so, so crucial. All of that is now at risk, and it will be the people who actually pay the price uh, of this in real life if jobs, investment and education suffer as a result. In July, the, the joint statement from the Scottish Government and University of Scotland reassured EU students in Scotland that they will continue to benefit from, e from free tuition and associated support for the duration of the course, and that's something that I very much welcome. And this sends a clear message that EU students are welcome in Scotland and that their contribution is valued. And that we welcome all international students who choose to study at Scottish higher education institutions. The number of EU international students at Scottish higher education institutes is a testament to the world-class university sector we have with five universities in the top 200 in the world. I'm saying officer, Scotland is home to nearly 13,500 EU undergraduate students, nearly 5,400 postgraduate students, as well as 4,600 EU staff working in our higher education institutions. In anybody's language, that is a viable economic, social and educational learning contribution to Scotland. And it's good for Scotland and indeed for the wider UK for international students to be here and then go back to their country and become leaders and remember fondly of their time here in Scotland. Now, skill shortages are a particular issue for Scotland, with more jobs here being hard to fill because of, because of these shortages than in any other part of the UK. And the report by the UK Commission for Employment and Skills found that in 2014, 25% of all the job vacancies in Scotland were hard to fill because of a shortage in available skills. And that was up from 15% in 2011. Now, the Scottish Government has raised concerns that the increase in skill shortages has occurred in the period following the closure of the post-study work visa, something that's been touched upon already in this debate. And the Scottish Government have, have also consistently argued that improved post-study work routes would be beneficial to Scotland's economic growth. Now, the reintroduction of a post-study work visa, which would allow international students to remain in Scotland and contribute to the economy for a defined period on completion of their studies, is crucial for Scotland's future prosperity. And therefore, with the UK government reintroducing the scheme for the southeast of England at the expense of elsewhere across the UK, flies in the face of a one nation position uh, as we are continually here uh, from the London government. Now, I'm officer, I want to touch upon uh, the Erasmus scheme, something that uh, Ian Gray was speaking about a few moments ago. I have already put on record my personal involvement of studying in the EU via the then Socrates Erasmus scheme, as well as receiving funding via the European Social Fund to allow me to study from a master's qualification. And the College of Scotland briefing for today was, uh, they were absolutely correct when they state that the opportunity for student exchange within European, sorry, within Europe enriches the learning experience, enhances employability, and promotes greater understanding and respect of different people and cultures. I have to say that the social side of things wasn't that bad either. But, presenting officer, I think back in my time of studying in France, Germany, and Sweden, with great fondness and how my life was enriched by having these opportunities. However, without EU funding, I could not have went. My family went flush with cash and my parents always helped my sister and myself, but there was no way that they could have actually paid the extra expense to allow me to go and study abroad. I am delighted that Scotland has 1,600 students going to study in EU countries via the Erasmus scheme, but my disappointment is that it's only 1,600. I couldn't wait to sign up to get the chance to go and study elsewhere, because I knew that the opportunities and the, uh, would be hugely beneficial for me. However, now that Brexit, 
The Brexit vote has actually taken place, and we heard at the weekend that Article 50 will be triggered by the end of March next year. What's that impact going to be upon Scottish school students who are thinking about studying at an EU institution, but now can't, they can't be guaranteed the funding to actually go? Now, the easy response from some will be that uh, to this threat will be that the Scottish Government should fill that gap. Now, well, this isn't just a Scottish issue, but it's a UK-wide problem. Therefore, the UK Government, after creating the problem in the first place, needlessly, they need to guarantee that school students across the UK actually who do wish to study a language and do want to have that opportunity to go abroad sh should still actually have that opportunity. And certainly, I was a bit disappointed today, presenting officer, uh, to hear about the comments from Amber Rudd, uh, quoting what saying that tougher rules for lower quality courses. As I said a few moments ago, when someone goes to study abroad, it's not just about the education. It's about the social, the cultural, and also the economically beneficial aspect, effects of that opportunity. I, I, I do genuinely find Amber Rudd's comments to be offensive and also narrow-minded, to say the least. Despite the misconceptions of some, not every Scot has grown up in a tenement, but equally, not every Scot has grown up in a leafy suburb. Some Scots do want to study languages, and they do want to have that life experience of going to study in a different country. Surely Brexit shouldn't close off this opportunity and aspiration. Thus far, this is what appears to be on the horizon, thanks to the UK government. Second, also, I grew up in Port Glasgow. I've got a great family and my friends and my parents, they were always encouraging me to have a better life and also to look for better opportunities uh, than they actually had. And this is what parents do. They know that when, that when I picked languages at school, this was to open up those different opportunities for the years ahead. And I want to do likewise for my children, but also for every child in my constituency and also across Scotland. In conclusion, presiding officer, the uncertainty caused by the UK government delaying decisions it could lead to the financial exposure of many millions of pounds that if this is not addressed and it puts the significant investment and jobs at risk, revealing the reality of Brexit. And finally, presiding officer, this means a continuation uh, of, a, of as close a relationship as possible with the EU and also uh, for, for those of us in these seats that this means a continued membership of networks such as Erasmus and agreements such as freedom of movement and the single market. This is crucial for Scotland's economy going forward. Thank you very much. Can I remind members that as far as I'm concerned in conclusion and finally mean the same thing? So can I have Jeremy Balfour please to be followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think we can all agree that Scotland has one of the very best higher education sectors in the world. There's a tre tremendous achievement and one in which Scotland should be very proud of. As we heard from the Minister and others, the Times higher recently published the 2017 World University Rankings. Five Scottish universities featured in the top 200 and another seven universities featured in the list which represents the best 5% of universities in the world. The UK is second only to the USA for the number of institutions in the world's best 800. Europe has been and always will be a very important partner for the higher education sector in Scotland. Scotland's higher education sector is over 13,000 students of EU domicile undergraduate level, accounting for 8.9% of undergraduate degree students. Another 5,390 EU students study at postgraduate level in all Scottish universities, paying fees to do so. EU graduates can stay and work in Scotland under the current arrangements. By doing so, we meet demand for high skills and contribute to the economy by spending around £156 million off campus. Having a diverse student community made up of different nationals, both European and from other countries, adds flavour to the student experience and benefits those from this country and the learning environment in general. Scottish universities employ around 4,600 staff who are also EU nationals across a range of academic and professional roles. Of course, the, e EU, sorry, the UK contributes more overall to the EU budget than it receives. However, the UK is one of the largest recipients of research funding in the EU. Now, Brexit does present a significant change and challenge for higher education. 
But alongside these challenges, there comes new opportunities as well. And it is slightly depressing to sit here week by week, hearing from the SNP government and benches, just gloom and doom and more gloom and doom without any positivity. And I think they should maybe try to learn a new lesson. So I just to push on. Uh, a, recent, a recently stated by Nick Hillman of the Higher Education Policy Institute, universities are international institutes, are international community of scholars, and staff that predate the EU and will outlive our membership of the EU. Now, universities recognise they operate in a global... So. Daniel Johnson. So I'm very clear that, that international collaboration is something that the universities don't need the EU for, but they're already doing it. So what's the upside to universities and colleges of leaving the EU? Jeremy Balfour. Thank you. Bear with me and we'll get there in a moment. This is why, as mentioned by Liz Smith, even if we leave the EU, it does not mean that we leave Europe or become even less European in our ambitions. Universities want to maintain the closest possible relationship with our European neighbours and can you continue to see talent across the political boundaries. Of course, we've heard already about different uh, non-EU nations that have research. Switzerland, Norway take part in Horizon 2020 despite not being part of the European Union. A total of 13 associated countries contribute to framework programme budgets in production of a gross domestic product, which allows them to take part in research, apply for Horizon 220 projects with the same status as those of EU states. So it is possible for non-EU countries across the, uh, the world, across the country, sorry, I, I need to push on, <clears throat> to contribute based on their GDP. Now, clearly, the UK will have to negotiate a new deal in order to do this, but there is precedent in this area, and it can happen. Again, we've heard about the Erasmus programme from different people already, but countries, including Norway, take part in this, as do Turkey, Iceland, Lithuania, and Macedonia. Again, you do not need EU membership to be part of this scheme. And there's also surely an opportunity to forge relationships with non-EU nations. Scottish universities have gone abroad to other parts of the world. Heriot Watt University here, Malovians, have campuses in Dubai and Malaysia. And again, there are opportunities to develop further uh, places like that in other parts of the world. The Prime Minister has said, that she wants the SNP government to be fully engaged in Brexit negotiations. And we need to ensure that Scotland and the UK continue to do this. And fully participate in future discussions about EU research programmes. Alistair Sim of University of Scotland spoke of our universities as being part of a cross-border ecosystem. On this issue, we cannot walk in isolation, but must collaborate with the whole of the UK. In conclusion, Brexit is going to result in considerable change. The UK government and higher education sector must work closely together through Brexit negotiations to ensure that the UK remains one of the world leaders in higher education. I firmly believe our institutions have the ability to achieve this and cement Scotland's position within the UK as well as one of the greatest university nations in the world. And I'm happy to support my colleague's amendment today. Gillian Martin to be followed by Daniel Johnson. For, for once, I'm going to stand up and not speak about colleges. I think everyone expects me to speak about colleges all the time because I work there. But I just want to mention that while this debate's been going on, just come up on my phone, there's been a photograph of my former student, Jakob Sergovsky, being taught by Pshamik Vasilevsky, who was one of my former students who's now teaching at North East Scotland College. And they're very much in my mind as this debate is going on. I think it's important to get testimony um, from those most affected when we discuss the potential impact of Brexit. 
Recently, I got an email from Sam, who's a PhD st uh, research student and runs a lab at Aberdeen University, which works on how, looking at how inflammation and metabolism are linked and how we can treat diseases like type 2 diabetes and cancer. So um, I'm probably going to do something quite unusual, but I'm just going to use my time, if that's OK, just to read out her email and use my time to give her a voice. This is what Sam wrote to me. The EU is critical to the medical sciences in Scotland. I can't even begin to express how important our EU membership is. Personally, my lab is partially funded by EU money from several EU grants and initiatives. We have some of the best research universities in the world for biomedical research, working on antibiotic resistance, stroke, heart disease, dementia and cancer. One example of work being funded by the EU at my university is the development of the next generation of MRI scanners that will allow doctors to get more diagnostic information from people's scans for conditions like dementia, cancer and arthritis. Giving better medical information, but also more detailed research information that can help scientists develop new treatments. Collaboration internationally is one of the biggest parts of science now. A move towards large collaborations, the sharing of data and specialist skills across many institutes has brought a revolution in quality of research. From 1981 to 2014, the number of science papers published with just a UK address dropped from 84% to 48%, highlighting the amount of research done through international collaboration. The UK most certainly punches above its weight in international research and has the highest proportion of the world's most highly cited scientific research, placing it above the USA. EU funding and collaboration is at the heart of that success. The contribution to that figure from Scottish universities is disproportionate to our small population size. Scotland is a leader in university research in a wide range of disciplines. The quality of work conducted in this country is one of the reasons I chose to not go abroad to study for my PhD. EU funding and collaboration is only part of it though. The number of talented people that come to study here at doctoral level is incredible. In 2014 to 2015, there were 14,280 EU students studying for a full-time research qualification. Freedom of movement across the EU is critically important in allowing us to attract the best research students and the best staff from across the EU to Scotland. More importantly, it allows us to retain them. Abolition of the post-study work visa has made it incredibly diff difficult for universities to retain international research students, as students are now required to leave following completion of a PhD, rather than being encouraged to stay and further their research. And I worry about how the Home Office will allocate the work permits that Theresa May is now talking about. In the biomedical sciences, most jobs available are not on the Home Office's required list, and therefore they are subjected to full visa conditions, including earning requirements. Contrary to popular belief, research jobs are not well paid. The average starting salary for a researcher in biomedical sciences in the UK holding a PhD is £24,000 before tax, normally rising to around 30,000 after 10 years of experience. Will the loss of EU membership subject these staff to the tier two visa scheme with a threshold of 35,000 in earnings as a requirement for the indefinite leave to remain? We'll lose so many great people doing important work and progressing in the industry from doctoral researcher into independent researchers and the establishment of new labs and new expertise within the country leading to who knows what scientific breakthroughs. More generally, their morale is um, unbelievably low. Friends I have who work in research, who have come here to work, had children and are settled here, are now unsure if they will be able to stay. These fears at present make it very hard for us to bring and retain talent within the scientific industry as people begin to seriously consider leaving the UK. And that applies to me too. I complete my PhD in September 2017 and I'm now entering the phase of my career where I have to make choices about where I will go post-graduation. Competition for postdoctoral roles in research are already highly competitive and loss of funding and the breakdown of collaborations that Brexit may bring make me hesitant, hesitant to rely on staying in Scotland for my career. This is my home. I have lived here all my life and I deeply value the investment the Scottish Government made in allowing me to attend university for free and then further supporting my PhD through both university and NHS Scotland uh, research funding. 
and I want to return that investment. My dream is that one day I will be a professor at Scottish University, teaching, researching and helping further our knowledge and passing on to the next generation. Without EU funding, support and collaboration, I feel that this will be impossible and I will be forced to look abroad to get the most out of my career. Regards, Sam. So, Sam needs answers. Sam's colleagues need answers. Sam's university needs answers. Will funding be replaced? Will that collaboration be possible? Will talented EU citizens still be able to study and work in our universities? They need to know now, not in two years' time. Thank you. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Graeme Dee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think one of the things I've enjoyed most since becoming an MSP is the amazing visits that you get to go on. And it's a huge uh, pleasure and privilege for me to have the King's Buildings, the home of science and engineering for Edinburgh University, right in the heart of Edinburgh Southern. In fact, I have to say I'm, I'm such a self-confessed geek. Over the last two weeks, I've not just done one visit to the King's Buildings, but I've done two. And part of the reason is there's just such amazing work going on there. And let me describe two projects which are happening there at the moment. One is the LiFi project, which is a Wi-Fi replacement technology using ordinary LED lamps connected to a router, uh, allowing you to have the equivalent of Wi-Fi but through light. But it's 20 times faster than using cables. And because it's cable-free, the applications for getting broadband into remote areas are incredibly promising and exciting. Likewise, I got to see the Genome Foundry, which is essentially a, robotics, a, robo a, a robotic automated genetics lab where uh, robots are able to take um, genetic uh, sequencing and engineering round the clock. So while researchers are sleeping, their work is carrying on in the lab. So what struck me was the work there is innovative. It's, it's um, uh, creating our future, but above all else, it's highly international. Each of those teams wasn't just one or two people from other countries, but it was full of, of uh, people working from all over the world. So universities are important to Scotland. We have a legacy of groundbreaking uh, discoveries, but they also shape our future. And as we know, the spin outs from Scottish universities are highly successful. They are very much a real part in building our future industries. And universities are international because knowledge, as Shirley Ann Somerville points out, does not recognize borders. And it's clear because collaboration builds progress. And the broader that collaboration, the stronger the academic base you had. But I have to challenge Jeremy Balfour's comments in this debate today. Because while I agree and I understand that there are various programs that we can renegotiate our position in and get access to, that somehow trying to double think our way into describing those things as benefits or upside to Brexit is perverse because these are things that we can do already. We're already part of and the renegotiation is an additional cost that we do not need. So, Of course. Liz Smith. Uh, notwithstanding that there are very considerable downsides which I think um, we on this side of the chamber certainly uh, admitted to, there are upsides and there's a lot that we can be doing to, particularly in terms of some of the international projects for which some Scottish universities have been highly successful and they are well beyond the boundaries of the EU. Daniel Johnson. So I thank Liz Smith for the intervention, but I'm yet to hear what any of these upsides actually are. All I've heard is about renegotiating our way back into programmes we already have or describing international collaboration we're already doing. So where's the upside? I ask you, I'm yet to hear it. Because when you look at the numbers, it's very clear. Brexit is providing a very real and clear issue for our universities. At Edinburgh University alone, 10% of its research funding comes for you. That's worth £23 million. Indeed, Edinburgh University receives a quarter of the Scottish total. It has 91 Horizon 2020 projects worth €77.8 million. Euros, and 30% of its research is co-authored with other EU institutions. And the, I think a number of speakers have mentioned the issue, well, be it anecdotal, that our researchers are being asked not to take a lead in research projects. And that's not an issue just because they like having their name at the top of the paper. So as academic work is built on reputation. And if it's not Edinburgh University that's getting the credit for its groundbreaking work, whether it's in uh, Wi-Fi technologies or genetics, it will be other institutions which get that credit and allow to build their reputation. But it's not just about funding because universities are about people. But the fundamental process of our university is about taking the knowledge our academics possess and passing it on to our students. 
And when you have 14% of students in, at Edinburgh University coming from uh, other parts of the EU, and, uh, you can see the seriousness of that problem. And indeed, a third of those students are doing STEM subjects, which we know is so important to our economy. But that problem is even more stark when you look at staff. Two and a, almost 2,500 staff at Edinburgh University come from the EU. And in academic staff, that rises to 25%. And we have a context where we are already have uncertainty and insecurity because of the visa system the UK government has imposed. And that... Briefly. Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for taking the intervention. Can I just clarify, are the Labour Party in favour of Brexit or not? Are you campaigning now not for Brexit? Jeremy Johnson. We, we, we campaigned against Brexit, continued to take the view... Well, let me... If, if, uh, let me finish. We continue to take the view that those are, those are negative consequences, but we want to make the most of it. And I think it's important that we understand the realities of the negative consequences that Brexit poses. And the reality is this, is again, anecdotally, I'm told that staff and students coming to Edinburgh are, are being advised not to fly through Heathrow because the immigration controls there are such a nightmare to get through. And that is the reality of the context that we are putting our universities through. So we need some clarity. We need, there has been a total lack of vision or a plan from the UK government. Uh, the, through the summer, we heard that it was part of Theresa May's cunning plan to not say too much. But I'm sorry, silence is not a strategy. It's not shrewd. It's not tactics. It's a dereliction of duty. We need to know certain key things. We need to know basics. We need to know whether or not EU nationals living here now will continue to be able to live and work in this country. And we don't know that. We need to understand what is the vision for research in this country? How will our research bodies work with EU ones? But I have to say, the Scottish Government needs to provide clarity too. We need clarity for students applying this year, the closing dates of which are already on us. 8.9% of students come from the EU. But we also need to investigate the possibility for bilateral relationships with EU research funding programmes. And that work needs to carry out now if we are to mitigate the undoubted damaging consequences of Brexit. Thank you. Graham Day to be followed by Alexander Stewart, Mr Day. Presiding officer, these past few years have presented challenges for colleges as they adapted to the regional FE delivery models, the need to better align course delivery with future job opportunities and cope with funding reductions. Few colleges have responded better to those challenges as Dundee and Angus. The Mayor's College, under the leadership of Grant Ritchie and his team, boasts the most successful record in attainment for young people up to the age of 18. Its learners from the 10% most deprived postcodes achieve at 16 percentage points higher than the Scottish average. It has expanded the number of learners moving into advanced places at university year on year. It has doubled its activity with schools and is working more closely than ever before with Dundee and Aberdeen universities. And it's won a string of national awards around sustainability, learner engagement and student enterprise. It was the only Scottish finalist at the Times Educational Supplement College of the Year Award and was named the North East of Scotland Employer of the Year at the Cherries HR Awards, beating off competition from major national companies. So you would think Dundee and Angus College was looking to the future with justified and real optimism. But right now, there's a cloud hanging over the college, all of Scotland's colleges in the form of Brexit and the long-term implications of exiting the EU. The separate entities, and then in its current guise, Dundee and Angus College has benefited from some £30 million pounds in EU funding since 1998. Annual income from EU sources based on 2015-16 will drop by £2 million pounds following the EU exit. In the words of the principal, this, the loss of that funding will, given the majority of it has been targeted at attracting learners from disadvantaged areas and in supporting growth in SMEs, and I quote, have a profound impact, end quote, on the college's service to the community. Presiding officer, it's, it's worth exploring just what in practice that funding, drawn from a variety of sources, delivers. It has, for example, enabled the creation of a business incubator, an enterprise facility, a sustainable industries institute with state-of-the-art engineering facilities, and an employability centre. It has opened up reciprocal learning opportunities. Last year, for example, Dundee and Angus students had work placement opportunities in Sweden, Spain, Romania and Slovenia. Staff groups were in Finland, Spain and Sweden looking at teaching innovation. 
All told, 103 students and 38 staff took part in 14 such projects, returning to take forward best practice ideas gleaned from those engagements. Whilst groups from Finland, Spain and Sweden uh, made a total of seven different reciprocal visits to Tayside, Tayside, building upon the EU networking arrangements so valued by those involved. In total, Dundee and Angus College has established partnerships with 33 organisations in a wide range of EU countries. And courtesy of additional ESF funding secured through a national application by the Scottish Funding Council on the back of the awarding of additional credits, Dundee and Angus College during 2015-16 uh, were able to offer an extra 450 students the opportunity to study, study mainly around growth in this future growth areas such as business and finance, energy, life sciences, digital and healthcare. That EU funding has supported the delivery of around 20 courses to higher national standard across the college, involving an estimated 10 teaching posts. So little wonder is concern in the Kingsway and Arbroath campuses over what the future bre uh, post-Brexit hold, because it isn't just about hard cash, but the engagement opportunities that being part of the EU and those arrangements provide. The Tory amendment claims, and I quote, there will be new opportunities for both colleges and universities, especially in developing closer international links with uh, further and higher education institutions in non-EU nations. Perhaps so, presiding officer, but why go through the, uh, the unnecessary upheaval? And how will explora exploration and delivery of these be funded? Essentially, we're faced with tearing up all that has been established over recent years in terms of such collaboration across the EU. And, presiding officer, the impact of Brexit goes beyond simply that. For Dundee and Angus and other Scottish colleges, around 10% of the student cohort there are EU nationals, people who live in the communities I represent and who secured employment locally in the soft fruit, the retail and the care sectors, for example. Faced with potentially requiring visas, no paying of fees for them, will those who might follow in their fo the footsteps of these valued contributors to our society and our local economies simply choose to go elsewhere? A survey of EU students by Hobson's found that 82% would view the UK as a less attractive option for study if it voted to leave the EU. Again, the Tory amendment talks of the resourcefulness and the creativity with which further and higher education institutions have always reacted to changing circumstances. And they are adaptable institutions, but why expose them to the risk, the uncertainty and the pitfalls that Ian Gray touched upon? Be in no doubt, as I've laid out in relation to the college with a footprint in my constituency, the impact of Brexit looks like being severe for the sector. No amount of deflection by the Tories can disguise that. Presiding officer, with every passing day since the UK voted to leave the EU, the wisdom Scotland displayed in voting remain becomes ever more obvious. With every passing day, the need for Scotland to avoid having its ties with the EU cut becomes ever clearer. Thank you. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Mr Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As has been mentioned several times throughout the debate, those who work in the further and higher education sectors were overwhelmingly in favour of remaining within the European Union. And I think it's very important that we recognise the fact, understand the concerns that they have and work together to address them. There is no doubt that both sectors will face change and these challenges give opportunities. But we must also grasp the opportunities that are there and ensure that we do all we can in the new path that has been chosen by the United Kingdom. Take, for example, the Scottish Government's flagship fee tuition fee policy on drama South Scots and EU students. Part of that must now change and the response from the Scottish Government is to reset the funding policy for higher education, one of which everyone knows has within its uh, financial inequalities depending upon the nationality of the students and the problematic cap. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you the for Minister. giving way. The policy is based on domicile, not on nationality. Very important to recognise that, and I'm sure the member wouldn't want to misrepresent it to the Chamber. Mr Stewart. I did. I did indicate domicile and nationality. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for the intervention. Moving on, it might be the case that more Scots than ever are attending universities, but it's also the fact uh, that from the Scottish Funding Council uh, that we are seeing that domicile Scots are now in declining percentage of the total number of students that are attending. 
We also know that uh, the commitments that were made regarding widening access and the commitments that are there to ensure that we have that uh, taking place. So uh, I acknowledge the fact that change needs to take place and that change will come. The new status of EU students, whatever they will be, needs careful thought, particularly on the grounds of income stream, which is predominantly based uh, on the Scottish Government and is no longer taking part. No, I want, I want to continue. Thank you. As my colleague Liz Smith has already pointed out, there is the possibility that the introduction of a fee for EU students will reduce the number of applications from EU countries. That in turn will necessitate some careful arithmetic, arithmetic which the sector is keen to get as soon as possible and encourage Holyrood and Westminster to get work together to provide that. As universities in Scotland have said, this arithmetic is very important, especially when you're challenging and looking at strategic planning for the future. There are, of course, more opportunities in Scotland's institutions uh, than, we, than we move forward. And that has been achieved in many of them as we look at uh, some of an example. Heriot Watt in the city of Edinburgh is just one example of a university that has already uh, developed campuses uh, within Dubai and Malaysia. As the UK builds upon a new free trade agreement, with nations across the globe, Scotland universities can seize that opportunity to have uh, that international exposure. And thank you. Minister. Grateful if I'm going to Heriot Watt uh, University tomorrow, actually. So while I'm there, maybe I can explain to the, the principal and the other principals um, how they should um, adapt to what's already going on in China and, and the Far East, where agencies for students are already being told don't go to Scotland or the UK, it's closed, you should go somewhere else. Yeah. How, how do we actually yeah. deal, well, it's happening, you should go out and speak to the principals. Yeah. How do we deal with that? Thank you, Mr. for your intervention, but I'm sorry, Scotland is certainly not closed. We know that, and you know that. Scotland's open for business. You try to tell it occasionally, but you should listen to your own rhetoric. Scotland is open for business. One of our major concerns raised by the universities has been their future participation in research, and that's been discussed already this afternoon. It is, of course, important that we look at all streams of money that will come into research. Between 2007 and 2013, the European Union research funding uh, came through the Programme 7, accounted for 3% of the UK's total expenditure on research and development. We must nevertheless look at ensure that the universities are not worse off that is very important that we do that in terms of their research, their development and the funding that they can, they can achieve. Now, we've talked about Horizon 2020 programme and I think that does show a real opportunity. Now, we also know from associated status and there are 13 countries that have associated status, uh, including the European Economic Area members of Norway, Iceland, uh, Turkey and indeed Israel. Uh, as uh, Alistair Sim from University of Scotland has already said, he quoted that closely involved with the programme uh, are these, and they have access, so there's no different from being part of the European Union. Likewise, participation uh, in the Erasmus Plus scheme, the opportunities that they have are quite immense. It is also the, the opportunity that Norway and Iceland accept free movement of people, but they also include other nations such as uh, the uh, former uh, Macedonia and also Turkey. While the Erasmus scheme will continue to provide uh, domiciles from what we're doing here in 2016-17, it's very important that we look forward to what can be achieved and what is being achieved as we progress. In conclusion, presiding officer, the institutions that make up the higher and further education sector in Scotland are world-renowned for their teaching and their research. This is a great extent as to the result of the openness their ability to attract the best and the brightest staff and the students from around the globe. The vote on the 23rd of June of this year should not be seen as any rejection of that approach. While we have no doubt heard that we're leaving the European Union, we are not leaving Europe and we should continue to welcome those who have something to contribute to Scotland while also looking to the opportunities beyond the European Union to continue to have what we have going forward. And I very much look forward to seeing that being achieved. Presiding officer, thank you. Thank you. And I call uh, Jenny Gilruth. I should also let members know that Jenny Gilruth will be the last speaker in the open debate and will move to closing speeches after that. Ms. Thank Gilruth. you, presiding officer. I'd like members to cast their minds back now, 102 days ago to be precise, to the day that Britain voted to take itself out of the European Union, to take back control, to seize the opportunity to be a sovereign nation once again. The doom and gloom of the Remain camp was palpable. 
I do believe there are risks and uncertainties about the economy. I think people's jobs would be at risk, so said our new Prime Minister, Theresa May. If you don't know, don't go, warned Ruth Davidson. But to allay public concern in the run-up to the Brexit vote, the UK government helpfully published a reassuring document entitled The Process for Withdrawing from the European Union. Indeed, I'm sure we all share NUS Scotland's serious concerns that it contained absolutely no reference to education whatsoever. Nothing about schools, nothing about colleges, nothing about universities. So, presiding officer, perhaps Brexit is a good thing for Scotland. Education is devolved, after all. We can take back control. We can seize the opportunities that the Conservative Party have so kindly foisted upon Scotland. Presiding officer, higher and further education make a difference in people's life chances. In my constituency of Mid Fife and Glenrothes, 31% of school leavers from the 2012-2013 cohort went on to further education. More or less the same percentage of children live in poverty after housing costs are taken into account. At the start of last year, our unemployment rate was nearly double that of the national average. So education matters to my constituents because education gives you currency. It increases your earnings potential, it opens doors. Colleges in Scotland have directly benefited from European funding via the Developing Scotland's Workforce Fund and via the Youth Employment Initiative primarily. In total this academic year, Scotland's colleges will benefit from £18.2 million of European funding from these projects. Indeed, approximately £250 million of European funding has already been provided towards historic capital projects in the colleges sector. And in our higher education institutions, 23% of research staff, uh, only staff rather, are from the EU. And as has previously been stated, five of our universities are in the Times Higher Education uh, World University rankings, Edinburgh, Glasgow, St Andrews, Dundee and Aberdeen. Indeed, our universities receive almost £90 million of research funding a year from EU sources alone. Presiding officer, I am sure that members across the chamber were delighted by the statement from the Scottish Government and University of Scotland in July, which gave reassurances to EU students that they would continue to benefit from free tuition and support for the duration of their courses. The message from the Scottish Government is therefore clear. EU students are welcome in Scotland and their contribution is valued. I, like colleagues across this chamber, wrote to EU citizens in my constituency following the Brexit vote. One replied in response, when we heard the results of the EU referendum, my Polish friends and I were worried and frightened. Of course, I love Poland too, but my life is here. I am very happy here. Another said, I have lived in Scotland for 27 years and I have always felt welcome. But at the time prior to the referendum, I did, for the very first time, feel like a foreigner because of careless comments people made. Presiding officer, this is the reality of the Tories' Brexit vote. EU citizens who are mothers, students and workers now feel unwelcome. They feel that they don't belong. Scotland is home to 173,000 EU nationals. It's every single MSP's job to ensure that these people uh, recognise how much we value and need their contribution in Scottish society. Your nationality shouldn't qualify you for employment. That's what your qualifications are for. And that's why higher and further education are pivotal to Scotland's future. Less than a month after the vote, our new Prime Minister met our First Minister. I'm sure it was a cordial affair. The Prime Minister gave the First Minister a commitment that the Scottish Government would be fully involved in the process of developing a UK position in advance of Article 50 being triggered. It was, therefore, interesting to note the tone flip this weekend. There is no opt-out from Brexit, and I will never allow divisive nationalists to undermine the precious union of our four nations of our United Kingdom. So, presiding officer, the divisive nationalism which will drag the UK out of Europe is acceptable. The divisive nationalism which led this country into a referendum on our, on our EU membership on the watch of a party which Scotland did not vote for, that's fine. The divisive nationalism which yesterday saw the value of the pound drop to a three-year low against the euro, that's OK. But the civic nationalism which my party stands for is dangerous. That's ugly separatism. That's parochial. That's isolationist. Scotland should know her place. The sheer audacity of the Conservative Party when it comes to Europe knows no bounds. Presiding officer, Scotland didn't choose to be in this situation. Today's motion commits the Scottish Government to take action to stand up for Scotland's best interest, to maintain our membership of the European market and access to free movement of labour, to maintain the strong tradition of academic collaboration between European and Scottish higher education institutions, 
to insist that the UK Government ensures that we have a role in decision making and Brexit negotiations going forward. Presiding officer, I will end with the words of the former Prime Minister speaking in 2009 as then Leader of the Opposition. We need mutual respect and a politics which is about a discussion and a delivery rather than about confrontation and grievance. But whether it's hard Brexit or soft Brexit, the scrambled Brexit Scotland is currently being served up by the Tories is simply not good enough. Thank you. We now move to closing speeches. I call Monica Lennon and you have a, a very generous six minutes. Very generous. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. There have been many interesting points raised during the course of this debate by colleagues across the chamber. What has been clear from most sides is that the aftermath of the EU referendum is uncharted territory, particularly for the further and higher education sector here in Scotland. I welcome the points which recognise the importance and benefits of the sector to Scotland and echo those sentiments. It's for these reasons that clarity over the situation of the sector going forward after the EU referendum is so important. First and foremost, as, been, as has been raised many times during the course of the debate, we must provide reassurance to the students and staff at our colleges and universities. We have heard a lot of warmth and solidarity with the almost 13,500 students from the EU who currently study at undergrad level in our universities and the 5,390 students at postgraduate level. They make up over 13% of postgraduate hot students and almost 17% of research students. And as Daniel Johnson said, a third of these students study the STEM subjects, which are so vital to the future jobs and economy of this country. And as we know, under current arrangements, EU students can stay and work in Scotland after graduation. So EU students make a huge contribution to our universities and society. And I agree with members across the chamber that we must make sure that this is something which is not damaged by the results of the EU referendum. But in order to prevent any knock-on effect on the numbers of EU students, universities and colleges require urgent clarity from the Scottish Government over the fee status of EU students applying for courses in 2017-18. We know students are already applying for courses which begin next year. And institutions and applicants are currently being left in limbo over what the fee status for these students will be throughout the course of their studies. Andrea Nolan of University of Scotland told the Education Committee last month that universities require a response one way or another. I welcome Shirley Ann Somerville's opening remarks. Shirley Ann, as Minister, has acknowledged these concerns and I know that she will appreciate the urgency around this. So we hope on this side of the chamber that the Scottish Government will soon be able to provide answers and a timescale on what the fee status of EU students will be for those beginning their, stu their studies in autumn 17. Certainly. Stuart McMillan. I thank Monica Lennon for taking the intervention, but would Monica Lennon agree with me that in terms, particularly that regarding that question that she just posed to the Scottish Government, that clearly there will be a financial implication for that Therefore, the UK government should actually ensure that the Scottish government actually have any additional funds that are required to ensure that guarantee. Monica Lennon. Funding remaining. Yeah, well, if we'd remained in the EU, that would have been making that funding commitment anyway. But I'm uh, heartened by the commitment from Michelle Lennon to be able to keep engaging with the university and college sector and uh, our students in that regard. And in the same vein, I hope that the Scottish Government will be able to provide clarity over the position of academic staff and researchers and hope that they too will be given assurances that they and their dependents have the right to live and work here. There are 4,600 EU staff currently working across the 19 higher education institutions here in Scotland. Researchers from EU countries make up 16% of academic staff in our universities, rising to almost 20% in some of our institutions. Their contribution to our teaching and research excellence is vital. So I echo the calls from the joint statement from the UK National Academies that they deserve to receive absolute clarity over their position in the coming years. Similarly, outward opportunities for UK staff to collaborate and gain experience in other EU countries needs to be safeguarded. I know there's agreement across the Chamber that regardless of the EU referendum result, it remains vital that EU countries know that Scotland's further and higher education remains open and that the close relationship with our EU neighbours will remain in place. Central to this is that reassurance from the Scottish and UK government regarding the funding of research projects and student places. 
And as we've heard from some speakers today, the college sector in particular benefits immensely from EU structural funds, which created 3,500 extra college places in 2014 through £13 million from ESF. The impact of this funding for students in, in my region, Central Scotland, and of course the rest of the country, cannot be underestimated. It's vitally important that the UK and Scottish Government provide assurances about the continuation of funding in the event of Brexit and that they, along with the Scottish Funding Council, are pursuing all possible avenues to ensure the college sector is not adversely affected. Higher education institutions received 88.8 million of research funding from the EU in 2013-14 and that accounts for 13% of universities' total annual research funding. So these figures are not insignificant. And we all celebrate that Scottish universities are consistently punching above their weight in terms of EU funding, with Scotland receiving almost 20% of the funding delivered through the, the Horizon 2020, which is the EU's biggest research and innovation programme. Our excellence in research is recognised and rewarded by EU funding, which allows this work to flourish and continue. In closing, I would like to reiterate that I hope the Minister will keep in mind the importance of consulting students and young people on affected policy areas during the Brexit negotiation process, particularly in areas such as Erasmus participation in research funding. And I think we heard uh, very uh, well from Stuart McMillan about how his experience helped to broaden his horizons across Europe and you know, he's turned out pretty well, so we don't want other people to, <laughs> to lose out. <laughs> We should keep in mind that it is young people, particularly 16 and 17 year olds, as students of the near future, who will be most affected by any changes and implications of the EU referendum and how it's going to affect Scotland's further and higher education sector. So I hope, therefore, that the Minister and the, the Scottish Government will keep all of this in mind when taking forward any discussions on the process of Brexit and will make all necessary efforts to ensure that young people are engaged in this process. Thank you. Call Ross Thompson, an equally generous seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union on the 23rd of June, the response of the SNP government has been to show nothing more than belligerence rather than diplomacy. Rather than grasping the opportunity that Brexit presents, the SNP are only working to frustrate the process of the, EU, the UK leaving the EU and are working to shackle Scotland to the EU's failing institutions, working to blinker us away from the growing economies out with the EU right across the globe and are using the referendum to justify their agenda of independence at any cost and attempt to simply further their own interests rather than those of Scotland. It's natural that any change will of course present a new set of challenges and my colleague Liz Smith very conscientiously articulated what these challenges are for both further and higher education institutions. What will define this Scottish Government is whether or not they can rise to meet these challenges and maxima I'm just getting started, thank you. Whether or not they can rise to meet these challenges and maximise Brexit opportunities for the benefit of Scottish further and higher education. I recently met with University of Scotland and the stark message coming from our institutions is that the current settlement around university funding is unsustainable, with Scottish students being underfunded by 10%. Our current membership of the EU means we have to pay for the free tuition of EU students. EU law requires that applicants from Scotland and the rest of the EU... Yes, I'll give way. Daniel Johnson. I believe Mr Thompson is the fourth speaker from the Tory benches to hint at the fact that, that, that EU students could uh, cease to be funded by the Scottish Government. Is that now the Conservative Party position in this chamber? Actually, if you allow me to finish, I was actually going to clarify that in my speech. The EU uh, law requires applicants from Scotland and the rest of the EU are treated equally, often with Scottish students missing out on funded places at our universities. This costs over £80 million a year and is rising. When we leave the EU, we will have the new ability, if this Parliament chooses to use it, to charge EU students and use the money raised to fund bursaries and more places for Scots. 
It is important that our institutions and wider Scotland start to have a proper and thought-out debate about how exiting the EU can allow our institutions to raise additional revenue which can potentially fund bursaries and places for Scottish students. There is a myth that university in tuition in Scotland is free. However, we know that international students out with the EU, as well as English students, pay thousands of pounds to study here. Yeah. Currently, our universities charge international students fees of up to £14,000. Now, just for example, if our institutions charged EU students the full international rate, we could raise in excess of £220 million. Or if we were to charge EU students at the rest of the UK rate, we could still be raising over £90 million. Bear in mind that the cost of providing free tuition to EU students is around £87 million, and this would be saved by not providing free tuition, then potentially our universities could be better off by around £177 million if there was a course of action that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament wanted to take. Yes. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. Uh, uh, grateful yeah. for, for the opportunity to just clarify, could he, the member name one single higher or further education institution that actually thinks what he's espousing is a good idea? Because I certainly haven't heard any. Mr Johnson. What I have said is for this parliament to debate if it's a good idea. And University of Scotland, in my own meetings with them, have said that this, we need to have a fundamental debate about this. Because there are new opportunities that Brexit will present, and it's up to the Scottish Government to bring forward their plans on that. Now, this could help ensure places for Scottish students as well as provide the bursaries to support those students from the most deprived communities to get into university. Now, quite naturally, our universities have raised concerns in relation to research funding. And my colleague Liz Smith mentioned in her speech, our institutions have shown tremendous adaptability in meeting numerous challenges, and no doubt they will continue to do so. Members should bear in mind that the vote on the 23rd of June was to leave the structures of a political organisation. It was not a vote to turn our backs on our European neighbours. It wasn't about leaving Europe. We will continue to cooperate closely with our European neighbours and now have the opportunity to look beyond the EU to some of the most exciting and dynamic regions of the world. Our world-leading universities, therefore, will continue to collaborate with other European institutions. No, I'd like to make some progress in institutions as well as institutions elsewhere in the world. For example, there's the EU-funded Ebola Research Programme, which involves the Universities of Oxford, Stirling, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, 11 EU universities, and Swiss universities. This is a clear example that countries out with the EU, like Switzerland, as well as Norway too, have been able to collaborate out with the formal political structures of the EU. This week, the, no, thank you. The, this week, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, was unequivocal, and, and he stated that universities and researchers will have funds guaranteed for research bids made directly to the European Commission, including bids to the EU's Horizon 2020 programme and £69 billion pot for science and innovation, and with the Treasury underwriting the funding awards, even when projects continue post-Brexit. A move welcomed by Universities UK for providing much needed stability for our universities during the transition period as the UK exits the EU, as well as sending an important signal to European researchers that they can continue to collaborate with their UK colleagues as they have before. Currently, the UK is a net contributor to the EU budget. So even despite the funding and grants received by our institutions from the EU, it comes nowhere close to what we actually pay into the EU pot in the first place. In fact, even as a member of the EU, funding of our institutions is simply not guaranteed as it is subject to the decisions of the EU and its structures by people not accessible or accountable to our institutions here in the UK. In leaving the EU, these decisions can be taken here in the UK by bodies accountable to us. I want to quickly touch on comments made by uh, Jeremy Balfour, who acknowledged the challenges ahead and mentioned the Erasmus scheme, which was also mentioned by Ian Gray and Stuart McMillan. But bear in mind that, yes, Erasmus is coordinated by the EU, but it is a project for the European continent involving countries such as Norway, Iceland, Turkey, Macedonia, and goodness me, Liechtenstein. So if they're involved, there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest that the UK won't. Opportunities to go abroad will exist for our students, and the difference now is that these opportunities will now be extended beyond Europe, to, but to the rest of the world. Um, presiding officer, so far, Scottish Government ministers have bemoaned the result, and they have stoked the flames of uncertainty in pursuing their independence cause, which we have learned transcends absolutely everything else. 
Presiding officer, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, change brings challenge. Brexit brings challenge. But this Scottish Government must remove its blunkers in order to see the swathe of new opportunities for our further and higher education institutions, for which the Scottish Government are wholly responsible. Mr Russell should bring forward a blueprint to this chamber, demonstrating to us how he will seize the opportunities for our world-class institutions. Presiding officer, now more than ever, those who advocated both leave and remain in Scotland must work together to secure the very possible, best possible deal for Scotland as we forge a new positive relationship with not just the EU, but the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, Minister Michael Russell, if you want to speak up until 1728 or 1729, I certainly won't object. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I shall... Of course, do my best, and I'm glad my colleague, Mr Swinney, is looking forward to this. Can I, at the outset, declare an interest until the 1st of September? I was Professor of Scottish Culture and Governance at the University of Glasgow, which I should note is one of the top 200 universities in the world. Um, I have, as usual, spent the afternoon listening to the Tory description of the sunny uplands that lie ahead of us when we have exited the EU. Uh, those sunny uplands are so exciting that whilst this was going on this afternoon, the pound sank to a 31-year low, and just a few months ago, the IMF downgraded UK GDP growth because of Brexit. These sunny uplands are a fiction of the imagination of Ross Thompson, and having heard his imagination, that worries me considerably. <laughs> Um, not, at, not at this moment. Let me make a, a little progress and then I'll be happy to hear what you have to say. Um, presiding officer, I want to address two things initially. The present situation in higher education and further education in Scotland and second, the issue of research. In May 2012, presiding officer, I led the Scottish delegation to the plenary of the Bologna process, which was held in the Palace of the People in Bucharest as uh, Anorex in this chamber will know the world's second largest building. There were 47 delegations present, not just EU countries, not just sovereign states. Uh, the outer group was that larger group of nations, the inner group was a group of the European higher education area. And the purpose of the Bologna process is to ensure compatibility between higher education systems and to allow uh, students and academics to move from one place to another. Scotland has one of the highest ratings within the Bologna process. It is seen as a nation with key advantages. It is English speaking, it has high quality institutions, five in the top 200, many more in the top 1,000. There are no fees for domestic students and good access for others. But most importantly of all, it is part of the EU. So there is free movement for staff and for students. So in these circumstances, in the world of higher education, in the international world of higher education, membership of the EU is not a disadvantage, it's an advantage. It doesn't stop collaborations, it actually enhances collaborations. And in that regard, therefore, the Tory amendment is, to put it very kindly, fatally flawed. Perhaps I put it more uh, bluntly, it is completely and utterly wrong. The EU, coming out of the EU does not remove a tiresome impediment. Coming out of the EU actually creates damage for higher education in Scotland. And they're also, uh, I'm happy to give way, to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for giving way. Uh, he and I both wanted a different result, and we've acknowledged in this debate that the colleges and universities wanted uh, a different result. Is it not our duty and obligation to ensure that we make the best of that result and we move forward on that, and that there are opportunities, even if we choose uh, to, perhaps in this debate, accentuate some of the challenges, there are opportunities. It is our obligation to work together to ensure that we expand on these. The first, obligation, the first obligation in any inquiry is to tell the truth. I cannot see what these advantages are because there, are presently work, there is presently work being done uh, across the globe by Scottish universities and that has existed whilst we've been in the EU. I want to give four brief examples from my own experience. I had the wonderful experience of, of hosting a dinner with Anton Muscatelli in Calcutta, uh, which w welcomed old boys from Glasgow universities from the 1930s who were studying there. Scotland has had an international reach for generations. But more recently, I signed the Memorandum of Understanding in Putrajaya in uh, Kuala Lumpur for Heriot Watt University, established a new university there. I helped to open the Strathclyde Business School at Nodia outside uh, New Delhi, and I attended a seminar in Vancouver on Scottish literature involving Aberdeen University. None of those countries were, are part of the EU. All of them are places where Scotland is working, and I would think it would be hard to find a country in the world 
where Scottish universities do not have either a memorandum of, under a memorandum of understanding or actual live links. So there is nothing in membership of the EU that is holding back Scottish higher education. But not being in the EU will damage Scottish higher education. And the proof of that lies in research. Because we've heard about some of the details of research funding. But there's a more insidious problem. The UK is towards the, the bottom of the averages of spend on research. 2.08% across the EU nations in research percentage of GDP, only 1.72% in the UK. So outside the EU, at the mercy of the purse strings of the UK, we will do worse in research funding than we do now. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. And therefore, the threat to, to research funding in Scotland comes from leaving the EU. And, and every researcher will tell you the same through every university. This is a key problem. And indeed, of course, it's the opposite of what we heard during the referendum, where apparently staying in the, in the UK was wonderful to re, for research. It hasn't turned out to be that case. Now, the reality of the situation, we should acknowledge this reality in this chamber, is that Scottish HE and FE are doing well. They're world quality. They provide strong service to students. Uh, they undertake world quality research and they attract key staff from across the globe. And that is a big thing in higher education. There are five universities in the top 200 have to compete globally for staff. And staff often come with groups of students with them, uh, particularly doctoral and postdoctoral students, because they come to compete in this world. And they won't do so if there's insecurity. So Brexit, unfortunately, in reality, and this is the reality, gets in the way of success in higher and further education. So how might we cope with it? Well, here are four things that we need to consider. The first of them is we must have free movement, and indeed that is essential for participation in schemes like Erasmus. There has to be free movement. And unfortunately, the Prime Minister appears to have ruled that out this very week. So there is a threat we have to overcome. There has to be participation in key projects. And if you're going to participate in key projects, you've got to pay into them. So we have to make sure that we're part of key projects. There have to be guarantees of continuity of funding. Not the flimsy guarantees we've had up until now, but real guarantees. And most of all, of course, absolutely. Elizabeth. I, I'm grateful again that the Cabinet Secretary has given way. Would he acknowledge that within uh, the guarantees that have to be provided, that what the Scottish Government's responsibilities are with the income stream that is coming from different categories of students? Absolutely, but we, we would not expect, uh, I'm sure that we wouldn't see the Tories taking advantage of this situation to push their own agenda, their own agenda of trying to impose fees on students, which this government has resisted and will go on resisting, I'm sure, knowing the colleagues I have in higher and further education. And the final thing, if I may go to the fourth point, after free movement, participation in project and guarantees of funding, is honesty and accuracy. Uh, Ian, I rarely quote Ian Gray with approval, but he described the Tory attitude as po a Pollyanna attitude, and that is what it is. Week after week, we've heard this attitude that we just keep smiling, we don't talk about the reality, and in the end, it will all be okay. Well, it won't be okay, and we see from higher education what the problems are. So let's address the real issues. Free movement, participation, guarantees of funding, and making sure that we're being honest to every sector in Scotland. Let me address some of the points that have been raised in the debate. I have to say that I have a strong admiration for Liz Smith, as she knows that has never been an advantage to her in her own party. But uh, I am pleased that she has been so straightforward about the issue of post-study work visas and migration. It is very positive, and I wish her party listened to her more often on these matters, because she is utterly right. Without the post-study work visa, without a realistic approach to migration and free movement, we will not be able to keep our unique position. Now, I hope that, uh, they are also, that her party is also listening to Liz Smith about the issue of Scottish government responsibilities, because she made the point quite correctly that the Scottish government is responsible for HE funding. Uh, she hoped that we would be discussing and negotiating this with the UK government. I would welcome the chance to sit down and discuss matters of devolved competence with the UK government. So I hope she will go and say that to her Tory colleagues in England. But on financial issues, there are many solutions, many solutions to that at all. They do not include removing the opportunity for free education. They would include, of course, independence. Let me move on to Ian Gray's. Let me move on to Ian Gray's position on colleges and the threats to number of students and EU funding. We have a college sector that is, I believe, sharper, leaner, and more focused than it was before, but we need to do more. 
and the college sector will have to be assisted in some way if Brexit takes place because the, there are two key problems that he identified that are correct. One is the monies that are used from European sources in order to support the college sector, and the second one is the income that uh, these colleges often get from students who are EU citizens working here. And the biggest guarantee that we could look for immediately is a guarantee to the uh, rights of those individuals to stay within Scotland. That would help enormously. I have to say that uh, Jeremy Balfour, who talked a great deal about research, um, actually touched upon a key point when she talked about Norway and Switzerland as exemplars of countries outside the EU that were doing well. Perhaps I should point out that, CERN, that Switzerland, of course, is the most cited small country in the world in research, apart from Scotland per head of population, because all the papers from CERN, of course, are published under the Swiss imprint. CERN would not be possible without free movement of labor. Norway also has free movement of labor. So I hope if that is the belief of the front bench of the Tories in this parliament, they are making that point to the hard Brexiteers who appear to be control uh, in Birmingham this week. Because without free movement of labor, none of those things would be possible, and that research would not be possible. Um, can I remark on the tremendous contribution that Gillian Martin made in reading an email from somebody else that is not uh, diminishing her skills as a speaker, but she read a very important contribution to this debate. A very important question not answered by Amber Rudd today, talk, talking about the generous offer that's made to students and looking at tougher rules. The reality is, the reality is that the attitudes being shown today by Amber Rudd and by the UK Tory government will drive away good researchers because as her correspondent, Sam, says, they will feel insecure. They will question their future. And there are other places where they can work. And my colleague, Mr. Swinney, made that point about uh, uh, doctors this afternoon. In reality, university medical schools will suffer immediately because the uh, high, highly skilled medics teaching in universities can teach in other places. And they will look at what has been said today about doctors not being welcome and say, I could work elsewhere. Can I now finish with Ross Thompson's contribution? It would perhaps have been a happier debate if we had finished before Ross Thompson's contribution. He did unfortunately show that he had no knowledge of the sector, he had no support in the sector, and his suggestions would actually damage the prospects, not just of universities in Scotland, but of every Scottish student. Because it is complete nonsense to say that Scottish students are being squeezed out in any way. There are more students at Scottish universities than there ever have been. Their results are better than they ever have been. And, they, and the, whole, the whole way that Ross Thompson approached this debate was to inject a hardline, right-wing view of what universities should be. Unfortunately, it's not laughable, because if we allow that hardline, right-wing view to dominate the debate on higher education, then we will lose the precious advantages of Scottish higher education. And presiding officer, the advantages are threefold. One is it, it is open and accessible. It is honest to its traditions in that way. Secondly, it is of the highest quality. It is world beating. And the third one, the third great advantage of Scottish, Scottish higher education is this. We believe that education is a societal good, not an individual good, and we all benefit from that. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes our debate on the implications of the EU referendum. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 1809 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau and it's setting out a revision to the business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 1809. Formally moved. Thank you. And no one is asked to speak against the motion. I'll put the question to the Chamber. The question is that we agree motion 1809. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business when we come to decision time in a few seconds. The first question is that motion 1788 in the name of Bruce Crawford on the timetable for the Scottish, Parliament's, Scottish Government's draft budget 2017-2018 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that Amendment 1792.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend Motion 1792 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on the implications of the EU referendum on higher and further education, be agreed. Are we all agreed? 
We are not agreed. Parliament will move to a vote, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 1792.1 in the name of Liz Smith is yes 30, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Motion 1792 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Parliament will move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 1792 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville is yes, 93, no, 30. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time and we'll move on to members' business. We'll just take a few moments for ministers and members to change seats. <laughs>